you're listening to This Is My Story. I'm Ruth O'Reilly Smith. This show is all about sharing stories of how God's amazing love has changed lives forever. Today's episode is with Alan Langham, a former professional rugby league player who found himself in and out of prison after a string of violent offences. After an encounter with God, he not only found himself back in society, but also back on the rugby pitch. His story begins at home, experiencing trauma as a child. So I was very young. I never knew my, my father as a, as a small boy. He left when I was still a baby. And I was told by those around me that he actually physically stepped over me like a stepping stone as he was packing his bags and leaving the house. So that, that memory stayed with me for a very, very long time. And kind of, I was so angry towards this person I never knew because that's all, and I kind of craved having a dad. And I used to try and fix my mum up with rugby coaches and scout leaders and or anybody who were a decent guy. I kind of, oh, to my mum, oh, so-and-so, you know, is a, is a really nice, loving guy. But I, from a very early age, I kind of started to live in a bit of a fantasy world of the perfect family because was the, there was just me and my mum. Um, my mum was a very strong-willed, woman, very uh, independent, roll your sleeves up kind of character, the linchpin of the family, everything revolved around her. But life had, had really battered and bruised her. Looking back as a child, I, I never, I don't think I ever saw her happy. You know, she, she was to sit in a rocking chair and kind of wherever she was, wasn't a nice place. Um, and, you know, she was so loving. So there were lots of love in the house. And the family was very loving and we were all cuddly and everything else, but there was also a lot of chastisement and she could just, you know, flip out. And it's, you know, I was at the receiving of that, of being in the house on my own, just us two, you know? So I kind of took off onto the streets. As a young boy living homeless, Alan soon found himself experiencing extraordinary levels of bullying and abuse. You know, and my mum and dad wasn't married when they had me, and I was, I was, you know, I was called, you know, a bastard, you know, by the people on the street, which completely, I didn't know what it was. And she explained that she wasn't married, and was look all those years of childhood was just, you know, being being beaten up by people on the street, called names, clothes being given to us, never seemed to have. Any, anything, we were always what I call scrimping and scraping. I watched my mum rocking, rocking away in a depression, flipping out and going, you know, and, and kind of being violent. And then there was people around us that was, you know, sexually abusing me. After a period of sleeping rough, Alan went back to live with his mother, only to experience a further harrowing ordeal. I, I'd gone to bed um, on bonfire night. I'd been up to the rugby club. I was there by then, you know, a budding, you know, really starting to get noticed at the club. And so we went for the firework display and I had a real strut and thought I were, you know, a bit, a bit of a man, you know, a man's man, you know, man of the house. And I kind of came home and my mum had not made my supper. And I swore at her and all this different stuff. And all she wanted that night was a cuddle. And it it, it, haunt, it haunted me for so many years that I didn't, I didn't do it. I, I, I went off to bed with it in a huff, you know, and never in my wildest dreams I would imagine that that would be the last time we spoke. You know, I went up to bed, you know, my sister came in and you, you, there were, our front room door made a distinctive sound as you opened it. She opened that door and you know, she screamed, you know, and I was, so I came flying out of the bedroom, down the stairs, run into the room. By then, my sister would run out onto the street shouting help. You know, I, I, ran, I ran into the room, I shouted, Mum. I really thought I saw her eyes flicker. So I, I went over and put my hand on her neck, and it was the coldest feeling I could ever imagine, like shivers went through me. And then I started kicking the kitchen door in, crying inconsolably. And one of the neighbours next door, he was an ex-army 
you know, retired army kind of guy, and it grabbed hold of me by the shoulder and said, be a man, there's, there's women present, you know, dry your tears, kind of get your act together. So I, you know, followed his, what he said to me, and I think that was, that was the turning point, because then I thought, oh, I'm not meant to be crying like this, I'm not meant to be expressing that emotion, I'm not meant to be letting go or, you know, dealing with this in this way, and I need to be a man. In light of this advice, Alan would learn to express his emotions in more violent ways. I came up, turned onto the street, and I could see him um, selling everything out of the house on the front garden. And I run off. You know, they were just trying to sort of do the practical stuff, sort everything out. But for me, I thought, oh, look, they're stripping the house down. And, you know, and I, I run off into the woods. And then I went onto the playing fields, and, and people who would, who would usually beat me up kind of got a bit clever and I just punched one of them and started just attacking him. And I just felt this wave of release come over me, but also this wave of power. That this person, this this kid who bullied me and picked on me for years, he actually was frightened and killing up and, oh, please, Alan, get off me. And I, and I knew then that there was, there's was been a shift and this this rage just started to, to build and build and build. And as my house went, just before I had to move out, I flooded the house. I put, you know, just turned the water on, punched all the walls, ripped the pipes, and just kind of, you know, that attitude, if I can't have it, nothing can. You know, with, with violence came power. And over all those years being terrified and hiding away and, you know, being scared of the night times and scared of everything that kind of happened was that I could actually enforce some of that power through violence. And I became an extremely violent young man. Beginning now to spiral out of control, Alan looked around himself for a community in which to anchor himself. I ended up getting kicked out of school completely. And by then, thankfully, you know, I was really starting to get noticed as a rugby player. And my, my main aspiration was to become a rugby player. Mentally, I just started to idolise the big guys in the pub because my sister run, used to run pubs. So I, I used to go into the pub and watch how these guys operate. And I used to copy the walks and copy the style. Then we started to watch the Cray movies, the, the Godfathers and all that. So I wanted to become a gangster. Then all our kind of lads, we could have collided together as a catalyst, a broken, messed up people. And we, we became a, little, a small little family. So my, my mates, or you know, my crew as it were, became my everything. I probably had a crossroads. I had an option of professional rugby or life of crime. And I, at first I kind of played both. But then, unfortunately, I got my first prison sentence, 18 years old, big, strong rugby player, goes on to the, you know, into the, into the local prison. And I didn't have a clue, I was so green. You know, and these these were people who were criminals, and I would just I, I used to lash out in outbursts of drunk, drunken emotion being expressed in violence, where these guys, you know, committed acts of crime as a daily basis. And but then again, I I needed to be accepted, needed to be wanted, so I kind of became then into their family. This prison sentence was the first of many over the next few years, and when Alan wasn't inside, he was playing his beloved rugby league until an incident that would threaten to take it all away from him. I got banned from rugby league for life. You know, I kind of knew that day, that day I shouldn't have played. It was, it was the anniversary of my mum's death. It was, you know, it was in November, and it was always around significant dates I knew what were kind of coming and I weren't in the best frame of mind you know and I'd gone and it was a very tight game and I think you know pre being a Christian I played rugby as if I was you know f fighting you know it was why used to say it's legalised violence because I could inflict as much damage as I possibly could to other people without getting done for it There was a decision which was wrong. You know, the, the, the ref's decision was wrong. And instead of taking it on the chin, you know, I made a comment, or, you know, you, you know, and called him whatever I've called him. He's then gone to send, send me off. And as he's done that, I've just lashed out with, and I've slapped him around the, 
you know, the, the face as he's pulling the card up. I just seen the, and turn my, turn my back and just started to walk off the pitch. Unbeknown to me, I'd caught him flush on the thing, broke his cheekbone, and then I started getting chased by all the away supporters. You know, it's like, it's just gone crazy. They've abandoned the game. So I've then, you know, run into the changing rooms, couldn't get in, so I've started running through the middle of Wakefield, Crofton in Wakefield, in my kit, avoiding the, the away supporters and the police now coming. And I've just hid behind a, hid behind a bus, jumped, rung a taxi, got picked up in a taxi and have gone back to Doncaster. I had just completed my seventh sentence and I was on remand looking at years. So it was, you know, a, a relationship breakdown. I'd been accused of a hostage and kidnap situation. I generally had not done what I'd been accused of, even though my, I was out of order. So I walked into that remand. I've got, I've got to court and as soon as they've put my record out and the, the alleged circumstances, what had happened, straight to prison. During this stint behind bars, something changed in Allen, beginning with accepting an invitation from the prison minister. I'd gone to the chapel, broke down completely crying and everything else, and they invited me back then to the next group, which was a couple of days away. So I had a couple of days, and it, I don't know, something, something had changed. It was like... Probably now looking back, God was at work, but it was as if I had lost absolutely everything. I couldn't even pick the phone up to ring anybody because nobody would have answered it. There was nobody to ring. You know, it was like I was completely just, you know, just just lost. Broken, ashamed, abandoned, a wreck of a man. And I was just trouncing around the exercise yard and the wing just, I, my head down. I, I, I'd been beat. I'd, the system had just broken me. And I tried to rebel and fight that system for 20 odd years. And I had a big reputation in the prison of now, and people were frightened of me, and officers were like, oh, you know, give him, you know, give me luxury jobs and little things just to keep me quiet and those kind of things. But I didn't want none of that. I just want, I, I just had enough. And, you know, about f five years previously, my best friend had killed himself. And I'd found him, and that scene had just. You know, it, it, I, did, I could never imagine how we got to that place, but mentally I was in that place. So I went back to the chapel when I'd been invited down and there was a few of us in there and we've all started to pray um, about Father, what I call now the Father's Prayer. And the minister led the prayer. We held hands, there were a few of us were praying for us, us as fathers and us as absent fathers. But the power of God hit that room. Like you would never believe, this is in a prison chapel, you know, and kind of, you know, holding hands, broken men together. Absolutely, and I walked out of there so convicted that I was like, ah, I've got to end it all. I mentally kind of said to me, all right, I'm just going to take a load of tablets. I knew I wouldn't hang myself, I knew I wouldn't cut myself. I mentally got to that place where I'm just going to get a load of tablets. and. And I just dropped to my knees, completely broken. And there weren't just tears, this was from the pits of my stomach. An absolute broken wreck of a man on that floor, completely lost, completely broken, ashamed, disheveled, no hope, going nowhere. And I had mentally been staring out of them, that window for days on end, watching these, these pigeons, just so depressing, so dark, just looking at it, and I just said to myself, you know, to, in my mind, God, if you're hearing me and you're with me, put a white bird in replace of those pigeons. You know, my mind was so shot to pieces with all the severe mental health that I needed a crystal clear confirmation that God will one, hear me my prayers, and two, was with me. That was my, my little deal. And I, and I went to bed, I didn't kill myself. I got up in the morning, I used to smoke in those days, so I made a roll up, went to the same window, same again, pigeons are there on the apex, up and down, up and down, and that dark feeling comes on you. And then it was like a slow motion kind of thing that lifted up and then the white one sat down. And it, and it, like inside something just jumped. And I came running out of the prison cell. Just, there is a guard, there is a guard. 
And I knew without a shadow of a doubt that there was a God. And I made a commitment in my heart there and then. This moment was the beginning of a dramatic change in Alan's life. I started to read the Bible. Joyce Mayer, Battlefield of the Mind. I had a notepad, a pen, and I started the journey as a new Christian in, in Leeds prison, Armley prison, and straight away, the first two cellmates I had were Christians. I got to the point in Joyce Mayer's book where she had mentioned about the abuse of her father and how she balled it up and laid it at Jesus' feet. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea with my, with my rage. So I did that that night. I just balled it up, put it at Jesus' feet, went to bed, and I woke up with the gift of peace. And by the grace of God, seven years later, I have never hit anybody. I have never lashed out. I've got no mental health diagnoses. He's of right mind. There's been other things which has been a process and I've had to go through this, you know, a deliverance and other things that go with that unraveling of a 30 year living the wrong way. But instantaneously God took the rage and that and that unpredictability and that mental mental illness. Alan would also come to understand the power of prayer after praying with Claire, the prison minister at Leeds Prison. So we made an application to get me bail and it got refused. And I really, I were, although I had peace, I was a bit down because I thought that I'd get out and I got a bit upset. And I went to see Claire and I sat down. And I said, look, I haven't done this. So well, let's pray. So she, she prayed with me for the truth to be outed, for justice and all, you know, all, you know, prayed and everything else. Went away. I went back to my cell. And then about an hour later, she come back to the cell, you know, open the door and give me a word for today. And it was, she said, God's, God's told me to give you this scripture. And I, you know, I didn't know what that, on earth that meant. You know, how can God tell you to do something? And what's this, what's this about? So I've took the word, word for today and kind of, you know, kept it. Two days later, the same cell door opens and the officer says, come on, pack your kit. You go into court, and I wasn't due in court until you know I'd never been set a date. I said, "Nah, man, I'm not due in court." They said, "No, you need to go. You need to go now. Pack your kit. You're not coming back." We got to the court. I've come into the court and then underground. My solicitor's coming, like thumbs up. You're going home. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt I needed to go to church, but. Me being me in them days, all I needed was a pint. You know, so I went straight to the pub, you know, got drunk, took drugs that weekend and everything else. But I, I turned up at church on the Sunday, hung over, you know, weed in my pocket, just didn't know anything, but I went. Bold walk straight to the front, you know, heard the music come on, threw my hands in air, look, you know, loved the music. And then the lady came to, to preach and it was uh, the outline of her sermon was the same scripture be still and know that I am God from the Psalms for his extent that I'd been given in the word for today by the prison minister and I thought it was a conspiracy one big setup but I knew then that God God could talk through one through people but through two through his word and I, and I went then and started the journey in that in that church as a rough and ready ex-con, ex-criminal, drug dealing, rugby playing, all the kind of different stuff. And that journey started that day and it's still continuing. But what of Alan's beloved rugby league? I became a sports chaplain and we appealed my ban and they overturned it to coach and mentor players but not to play we reappealed the following year to the rfl to the rugby league and i went through and um at a meeting the chair of that meeting was a was a police officer you know and he just said look I, i've seen this time and time again where 
you know, I've been, you know, cri criminals in front of me all my life. This is a changed man, you know, and they unanimously put me back into a belief to play. So then I, I started to play. And I was playing one of the best rugby I'd ever played because it, I could actually see the game for the game. And I could actually see the game. I had vision. But before it was, it was just channeled. I just saw red. And I just wanted to take the man out in front of me. And I couldn't see past that. Whereas playing as a Christian, I had scope. I, I could see the other players. I could see gaps. And I was probably one of the, one of the hardest, strongest players. I've always given penalties away for you know, kicking out or lashing out or thing, and you know, I don't even give a penalty away. I mean, I played so much better because it weren't about me no more. That was Alan Langham on This Is My Story. Subscribe to this podcast on your favourite podcast app or for more information, please visit ucb.co.uk forward slash this is my story.